Welcome back guys. I've got Barocca on the workbench today because I'm going to make an active blend control. So even if your bass is active, it's most likely that the pickup signals are blended prior to the input of the main preamp in the passive uh, sort of high impedance part of the circuit. But in the last few years I've noticed uh, a few of the aftermarket preamps coming through with active blend controls uh, incorporated into the design. Guys like John East, uh, Ordea, uh, EMG have an active, active blend control module as a, as a standalone unit. Uh, I think Bartolini still sell a little twin buffer preamp module as well. And that's really what an active blend control is. It's uh, a buffer preamp for each pickup and then the low impedance signals from each of those is where the blending happens. So why would you think about having an active blend control in your bass? Well, I think there's three main reasons. The first would be if your two pickups have very different impedances. With an active blend control you could have say a passive mud bucker and an active EMG in the same bass and you'll still be able to blend and smoothly fade from the sound of one pickup to the other even though the active EMG pickup has a very low output impedance due to its onboard electronics. If you have say a piezo pickup in the bridge and you want to blend that with a magnetic pickup um, then it's kind of the same deal. The piezo pickup has a very, very high impedance traditionally and uh, you'll need an active blend control to be able to smoothly blend from one pickup to the other. Another reason you might think about having an active blend control in your bass is if you've got two pickups with very different outputs. And if you design the circuit yourself, you can potentially have a little bit of gain on one side or a bit of attenuation on the other, and you can even out the, the response of the two, the two pickups. And that way, you're not limited only to kind of radical pickup height uh, adjustments to, to get that even response. The third reason you might think about having an active blend control in your bass is really the main reason I'm putting one in Project Barocca. And that is if you want to tweak the tone of one pickup without affecting the other pickup. When you blend in the passive world with a couple of volume controls or um, say an MN blend pot, the pots interact, the pickups interact, the pots also affect the tone of the pickup. Um, but with an active blend control, the pickups are kind of isolated because of those two preamps. And they also see or feed a, a constant load impedance um, or a capacitive load if you so choose. With this bass, I want to be able to tweak the tone of the neck pickup. Uh, I'm going to try and make it sound as much like a traditional passive Fender pickup as possible. Uh, but I don't want those tweaks affecting the nice, bright, clear, stingray sort of tone I'm going for with the bridge pickup. So here's the circuit. Notice the battery is connected through this diode. Uh, it isn't strictly necessary, but it's known as a protection diode, and it may save the circuit from damage if the battery was ever connected the wrong way. These two resistors form a voltage divider and that gives us our bias voltage. With a fresh battery that'll be around four and a half volts. Onto the buffers themselves, C1 and C3 are optional. These are there to simulate the capacitive load of a typical guitar cable. For Barocca, I'll have a cap on the neck pickup um, that I wound in the last episode because I want this to sound a bit more like a passive fender pickup but I'll almost certainly have no cap on the bridge pickup because the old Stingrays have their pickup directly coupled to the preamp and that's a big part of that bright tone I'm going for. C2 and C4, these are coupling caps. R1 and R2, these are quite important. These actually set the input impedance for each buffer. It's most likely I'll set R1 to 100k because if memory serves, that's the input impedance of the original 1970s Stingray preamp. R2, well, I'm not sure yet. I'll be testing the pickups and choosing these parts in the next video. Each buffer uh, is wired in a very standard way. It's known as a non-inverting voltage follower. That's really just another name for buffer, to be honest. Notice that the outputs are directly fed back into uh, the inverting inputs at pins two and pin six. This gives no additional gain. 
Uh, but if you do need to add some gain to one or both sides, this wire link between pins one and two or between pin six and seven has to be replaced with a resistor. And you also need to put a resistor between the inverting input and the bias voltage. Uh, there's provision on the board for those extra resistors. In fact, I've put a PDF together for this project with the stripboard layout, how to choose gain resistors that you may need, um, and some other info as well. And I'll post that on my website in the next day or two. Because op-amp buffers like this have such low output impedances, it means you can simply use a single gang linear pot as the blend, wired directly to the op-amps as shown. But of course you'll need an output coupling cap, and that's exactly what C5 is. The pot is shown as a 10K pot, uh, but really any linear pot from 5K up to say 50K will work, provided that the load of the next stage is at least five times this value. As is, the circuit is designed to feed uh, directly into a preamp, uh, but if you want to use it as a standalone circuit and need a volume pot on its output, you can essentially replace R3 with that pot. It should be an audio taper, and again, at least five times the value of the blend pot that you choose. This is also covered on the PDF um, that's on my website. The board layout is only nine strips and 13 holes. So it's only going to be like uh, an inch and a quarter long and about an inch wide. It means the parts are kind of cramped up together and several of the resistors have to be installed standing up on their ends. Uh, but I've done that in the interest of making it as small as possible for fairly obvious reasons. Make sure this wire link here is installed first because it goes underneath the IC. And also make sure these electrolytic caps, the diode and the IC itself are installed in the correct orientation. Um, the strip board itself is super simple to make. You can see that all the cuts are in a row uh, down the middle here. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to get on and make this board. Okay, so here's our little circuit board. It literally took, I don't know, like two minutes to make. You can cut it with a Dremel wheel or uh, carefully with a hacksaw, but I usually just put it in a vise, score it on both sides, and it'll snap off very easily. To cut the tracks, there's several different ways you can do it. I do have a proper Dremel, but um, I normally just use this little hand piece <laughs> that I've had for years. It was very cheap. It does use Dremel, Dremel uh, burrs and stuff. I guess I'm just used to it. I don't know why I use it. It's small and quite wieldy. The bit I use normally is this guy, uh, but you can honestly drill them. You can also put like a little, uh, like a cutting burr and just drag it across and you'll actually get a cut. Um, and like I say, just experiment with whatever tools. You can, you can even do it by hand if you don't have one of these tools, just by sort of pushing a screwdriver across and into the hole from both sides of the hole, and that will usually go through the tracks as well. It's very important to test that you've cut the tracks cleanly. Um, in fact, when I did this, I thought I was okay, but I actually did have a little short across two tracks that should have been cut, so I had to go back. Um, and that's easy, easily done with a multimeter. It's also nice, I think, to just sand the edges up and tidy it up a bit, although, of course, that's not strictly necessary. So I guess the next step is to gather up all the parts, and I think the first thing you should find is the IC, the uh, chip, the dual op-amp. And there's hundreds you can use. I think I've listed four or five on the circuit itself. Um, with a circuit like this where you're running little or no gain and a moderate input impedance, Honestly, a TL062 will work just fine and you'll get great battery life as well. But if you are doing a fair bit of recording and all the rest and you really want the, the best, uh, you know, lowest noise, um, you might want to go for an NE5532 or an OP8, uh, what are they called, LM833. These are sort of more high hi-fi, um, low noise sort of op amps, but they will drain the battery a bit faster. Um, I've got a bunch of these... Um, Oh, where is it? I've got quite a few of these uh, MC33178s. Um, so that's what I'm going to use because it's a nice compromise. It's not too heavily draining on the battery, but it's got a great noise spec as well. Okay, so here are, well, not all the components I need, but most of them. For the moment, I'm going to leave off C1 and C3 and also R1 and R2 until I know exactly what's capacitive loading and also the impedance loading that I want to give me the sound I want. And I'm going to do 
a bit of that work in the next uh, episode where I'm going to test all the pickups and decide uh, what parts I want to use for the front end of these two buffers. That's our uh, coupling caps. These are called monolithic caps. These are quite small. Um, there should be enough space on the board for MKT caps if that's all you can find. There are 220 nanofarad C2 and C4 caps. That's our dual op amp. That's an IC socket. Um, that's our output coupling cap, our 10 mic cap. Notice that the positive side is marked on the schematic and it's also uh, marked as a square uh, square hole on the, the layout. It's an odd quirk of electronics because um, with most electrolytics it's actually the negative lead <laughs> that's marked on the packaging but it's the positive leads that are marked on uh, schematics and so on. It's just uh, the way it is I'm afraid. Um, there's our uh, R3, it's a 220K um, resistor. If you're new to this stuff Reading um, color bands on resistors and, and markings on capacitors and stuff can be confusing, but there's plenty of support material online. Honestly, there's there's charts and, and how-to videos and all that sort of stuff, so just get amongst it. It's not really that hard, um, and you can always test them with your multimeter if you're not sure. Down here, we've got our parts for our power supply section. That's our diode. If you look carefully, uh, there is a band at that end, and that correlates to the, the well, it's actually a cathode, um, but you can see that's the band uh, or the line on the uh, symbol for a diode. And again, on our layout, there's a band marked on that component as well, so you can get it orientated correctly. You, for that matter, you can see there's a little notch here on the IC socket, and there's also a little notch um, on the IC itself, or sometimes just a little dot pressed on the IC, um, and that is also marked on our uh, layout. Just be aware that with ICs, the top left, if you have the notch or the marking at the top, then the top left leg is pin one, and then you count the pins anti-clockwise. So, uh, so the bottom right pin is actually pin 5, 6, 7 and 8 is the top right. Okay, so I've got a big blob of blue tack on a piece of timber and I've got this non-slip surface on my bench. Uh, it looks kind of amateur, but honestly it works really well. Even if you're kind of seasoned as a board soldering guru, I recommend giving it a try. It works really well for me anyway. Um, so I've got the link in first. I've got to do that because it goes underneath the uh, IC socket. my little circuit board. It's, uh, where are we? It's not quite complete as I mentioned, but uh, I think that'll be enough for this video. But I do have to check uh, that all the soldering is um, good and that there aren't any solder bridges across tracks or between parts or whatever. And the way to do that is with magnification and good lighting. To be honest, I normally solder with my um, magnifier and my light, but on camera it makes it strobe and it also throws the white balance off. Ah, <laughs> okay, so there is a little solder bridge. I probably should have used this when I soldered this uh, board up. But um, I'll show you how um, I can fix that. 
that is our little solder bridge right across there hopefully the camera can catch it and what you're seeing there is the soldering joint from the bottom of r4 bridging across between this uh, bias voltage or v reference across to the input and there's two ways i could fix this i could simply cut this track here and then run the input from the other side that would work just fine but i think i am going to see if i can just suck up some of this excess solder with my desolder pump Oh, okay, there was a little tiny fragment of something bridging that gap, so that looks like it's okay now. Let me resolder that and we'll check it again. Yeah, that's, that's fixed it. That's absolutely fine. Soldering, just like anything, like playing your bass, actually takes practice. And again, there's tons of how-to videos and all the rest of it. But really what you're going for is just nice, clean, shiny soldering joints. And a big part of that is just having two clean parts. I uh, always give this copper, these copper tracks a bit of a rub with some steel wool to make sure they're clean. And if any of these uh, parts have tarnished looking legs, I do the same with those. Um, also, um, I like to linger just for a second or two after each solder joint until the flux has burned off because it's the flux that's really creating that uh, good shiny solder joint. Anyway, thanks for watching. In the next episode, I'll be testing the pickups and uh, choosing those last couple of components for our little active blend control. And I'll also be wiring it up and uh, giving it a whirl in the base. If you just stumbled on this video, uh, please consider hitting subscribe and the bell. Every YouTuber says that, of course. Uh, but I am currently making a whole ton of videos on this, my orange Barocca project base. Um, and uh, if you do want to see the next um, instalment, uh, that will get you there. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm, yum, good dragon fruit.